we very strongly recommend in every episode, pay your taxes. I like to talk about Al Capone a lot, responsible for killing tons of people, but like the government really didn't get him until he didn't pay his taxes. So don't be Al Capone. This is Unemployable, the podcast for independent workers, freelancers, Dow contributors, and other self-employed folks who want to own their employment and become self-sovereign. We may work alone, but we can be unemployable together. This episode of Unemployable is brought to you by Opolis, providing healthcare, benefits, and payroll for the self-employed. Join the community at opolis.co, O-P-O-L-I-S.co. Welcome to Unemployable University. I'm your host, Joshua Lapidus, and today we're talking about legal tips for freelancers. There are 58 million freelancers in America. That's 36% of the U.S. population, all trying to find independence, self-sovereignty, and peace of mind outside traditional employment structures. That number is projected to grow to 90 million by 2028. So whether you're one of those 59 million freelancers or dreaming to become one of the 90 million, this episode is full of legal tips and strategies for thriving in self-employment. A quick legal disclaimer, the information provided on this podcast does not and is not intended to constitute legal advice. Though Yev is an extraordinarily talented attorney, she's not your attorney. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Yev Muchnik, an impact lawyer, Dow Co-op crusader, Apple's employee member, and a founding steward of the Employment Commons Board of Stewards. Yev is both a freelancer, my friend, and an attorney. Today, she'll be sharing her top legal tips for freelancers and her journey as a freelancer. Over the course of this episode, we cover why you should set up a legal entity, the contracts and documents you'll need for client work, strategies to protect your intellectual property, some best practices for protecting against delinquent clients. And if you wait until the end of the episode, Yev shares Alpha on some great places to find free and affordable legal advice as a freelancer. So jumping right into today's conversation, Yev, thank you so much for joining me on Unemployable. As an attorney who started out as a solo practitioner, you are the perfect guest for this episode. I'm looking forward to sharing your legal tips and strategies with the unemployable community. Can you tell me a little bit about your self-employment journey? How did you decide to go out on your own versus joining or staying in a big firm? And what sorts of interesting projects are you working on today? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, John. I'm really excited to be on and chat with you some more. You always have great conversations. So I started my career and my legal professional trajectory in a very sort of standard route. I started with a large international law firm called Squire Patent Boggs, was in their corporate private equity and M&A practice group. And that was great. It was a great experience. It was a great foundation in terms of skills, but it was really that experience of being, I think I was 25 or 26. I was working like 80 to 90 hours a week, seven days a week. My first position was actually located in in Moscow. So we moved out there, picked up the whole, well, just newly married then. So moved out there, you know, and faced all of the the challenges of being an expat and luckily maintained my Russian language skills. So that was really attractive to them. Yeah. And then I moved back to to DC, had a, a couple of other stints that were very similar with large international firms, and then was general counsel for a publicly traded tech company out on the East Coast. And then was moonlighting for a private aviation tech unicorn startup down in South Florida, moved down there and, and was their general counsel, helped them with their couple of rounds of their financing. Um, and then in, I think it was around 2015, 2016, that I had the kind of entrepreneurial bug that bit me and I really wanted to, to work on my own startup. So I ventured out of this more traditional trajectory as far as legal practice and being in a big firm and being in house and um, worked on my my startup and at the same time luckily fell into the web3 space and also saw a new practice area developing out of that so it made a lot of sense for me to start up my own boutique practice and so lo and behold here i am today after just really falling in love with the sector for blockchain and web3 having really, really good client relationships and being able to mature with a lot of these early stage companies that I met at that time and uh, haven't looked back since. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that you did make that entire journey because I don't know if the space would be the same without you. Thank you. <laughs> like two things I want to go back to. One, I also lived in D.C. So what part of D.C. did you live in? 
So we were in Foggy Bottom. I did my LLM at George Washington University and my husband was at American University. And I think that that's where we coincide because then we moved to Cathedral Heights for a while and I had yeah. my first son there in Cathedral oh, Heights. Cool. And then yeah, we I, I went up- to American, so I lived up in Townley Town and then yeah. the Maryland side and then Arlington LLM. So just- that's your, you got your lawyers losing money at GW. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my... Uh, Less of the of the worthwhile degrees to pursue, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I do have an LLC okay, the- as well, so I've got a lot of LLs there. I don't know what that one stands for, though. It's kind of like a, a bachelor's in law from the UK. Ah, okay, cool. And the second thing I wanted to go back to is when you went out on your own, as a lawyer, obviously you knew this, but how much of the like starting a business side did you already know? I need to create a company and yada, yada. It- it's amazing because when you counsel clients, you have so much wisdom and you have so much of the kind of to do's and the, the what's right and wrong and, and especially small business clients. But when it comes to yourself, you don't take this, you don't heed to the same kind of advice. So I didn't know very much about hanging up my own shingle. Obviously, I set up an LLC in Colorado, but I didn't know anything about malpractice insurance, health insurance, benefits, payroll. None of that stuff. It was so foreign. It actually took me a while to really become more ch- mature in my understanding and experience with that and being able to initially leverage some of the the software platforms that existed pre Opalist and the employment commons. But it was like, it was a really difficult road to navigate because you're trying to run a business and be profitable and serve clients. And then at the same time, you're like, wait a second, every now and again, I'd have this moment of panic of, I don't know if that I'm fully protected or compliant in how I'm doing things. And I, I've, for the most part, until just recently, been a, a solo small firm. So it's just been me with some contract attorneys and contract support staff and other kind of service providers. But yeah, but that's mostly how I've, I've ran things. And, but it's, it's been scary because we don't have the time, the resources, to really like understand all of the nuances and, and the tax and the benefit compliance stuff. And then you get, you get stuck in like decision paralysis and oh. different options. What do I do? So I know many Absolutely. of the lawyers who join the platform use a PLLC. Mm-hmm. What does that stand for? And what's the difference between that and a regular LLC? Um, it's a professional limited liability company. So some state bars mandate that you have like a professional entity. Colorado doesn't necessarily. So you can use an LLC, you can set up as a benefit, but Jason Weiner, PC, where I'm of counsel and affiliated with. So they're set up as a public benefit corp, which is pretty unique for a law firm, but definitely great. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different entity choices out there that you could use okay. to set up your entity as a professional. So and that, that applies not just to lawyers, it's accountants, or people with like, licenses. Yeah, the doctors, like psychiatrists, therapists, a lot of them use the PLLC as well. So Benefit Corp, that's that short is to B Corp. Yeah, yeah. There's PBCs, there's public benefit corps, and then there's certified B Corps as well. So slightly ah, different. Cool. So just in terms of the Opal's huh. talking points, I know that, and this gets into what we'll talk about in a moment about employment vehicles, but the employment vehicle is generally an LLC that elects C Corp, S Corp, or B Corp, or it's just one of those without the LLC. So yep. what the question I want to ask is, there's lots of different companies. It's generally expected that someone who is a graphic designer or doing their own thing is not going to understand all this legal jargon. How does a freelancer choose? What are some of the things that they should consider when thinking about these different types of employment vehicles? Yeah, I would say some of the things that you'd consider is what you're going after in terms of complexity of the structure, how how much it costs to maintain that entity structure in terms of franchise fees and annual taxes that you need to pay. And really, LLCs are, are hands down the simplest entity form, just because it, you know, in Colorado, you can form it online for, for $50. You can do all of oh, your wow. filings on your own. You don't need a registered agent. So it tends to be very simple, especially for a single member LLC. Now, if you're looking for kind of additional protections in specifically for LLCs, you may want to consider other states like Wyoming or Nevada or Delaware that have more enhanced kind of privacy rights and additional kind of asset protection rights that maybe some other jurisdictions don't have. So this is really where you would 
potentially consult with an attorney that could advise you on something like that. But as it relates, considering whether you should form as a corporation, as a whether you should form as a PBC or any of the other kind of entity as a co-op, any other kind of entity structure that that is out there, you know, a lot of it just really like pushes back on how many people are going to be inside that entity structure. For employment purposes, usually it's a, kind of a single member. But if you have many shareholders, if you have investors, then you would maybe consider another type of entity. The other thing, you know, with corporations, you have double taxation. So you get taxed at the corporation level, and then you distribute that to the shareholders. So that's an additional taxation. Whereas with LLCs, you can have it as a pass-through taxation, or you could elect subchapter S taxation, which is also beneficial. And then you can write off some of the kind of employment taxes that you pay and, and do it that way. So it's, it's tax optimized if you're an LLC that elects s curb taxation. Got it. And I think I asked the second question first, but to, to get to that, do freelancers need a business entity at all? So if you're going to do business, you can just be a person or... You could, and then, you know, you'd be a sole proprietorship. So that's generally, you could run that way and you could elect different kinds of taxation status with the IRS, but it's generally better to envelop yourself with legal liability protection. And that's what an LLC gives you so that if you have a creditor or a judgment that comes against you, usually it doesn't penetrate through to your personal assets and you're not personally liable, save for the case of fraud and, and bad actors and malfeasance. So in those cases, you don't get that limited liability shield and you pierce through the corporate veil or somebody Got can it. pierce through the corporate veil. Okay. And then in the context of Opolis, you need an entity to join the commons. And I was wondering why that is. So the way that the commons are structured is that it acts as the employer of record for basically the self-employment structure. So if in setting up an entity, you become the actual employee of your own entity, which is the employer. And then that feeds into the common structure who acts as an employer of record for those employers. And that's how you can access you know, the benefits and the aggregate bargaining power that you get with a larger group of individuals that are vying for, for benefits for, in healthcare. Got it. Okay. So that's, that's why we call it an employment vehicle. Because um, mm -hmm. normally you'd have to work for a large company to be able to exactly. access some of these benefits. But here you're becoming self-sovereign and you're setting up your own entity and you're, you're creating and wrapping yourself in an employment vehicle. Exactly. Yeah. So it's much like a traditional PEO, professional employment organization structure, if folks are familiar with that, where you have large employer group, you know, you could have even very well-known companies like Uber and Lyft and maybe if Walmart wasn't as big as it is, but, you know, it could kind of join a PEO as the employer group and then have the individual employee relationships, but, but receive the benefit of the, the PEO structure. So Opolis and the Employment Commons are like a decentralized employment organization structure, a DEO. Got it. Okay. And so in the context of protecting ourselves and protecting the commons, one of the most important things we can do as freelancers is to use legal documents for this protection that clearly communicate you know, role, scope, timeline, and costs specifically with clients. Um, Absolutely. So I want to ask about the <clears throat> client service agreement. What is this and why should freelancers use client service agreements? Yeah, I mean, whatever you call it, whether it's a professional service agreement, client services agreement, master services agreement. And I, I think I forgot to make one very important disclaimer, which is anything that is discussed on this uh, podcast is not meant to be legal or tax advice or investment advice or any kind of advice that you should really consult with your lawyer, your, your tax professional. I think we, we run a pretty fun disclaimer that like, yeah, is a really talented attorney, but she's not your attorney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I am always happy to be a resource in the community. And I have acted as one before, especially for the comments. I've got free 15 minute Calendly links that you can utilize and we can share that somewhere. So you can reach out if you've got any of those types of questions, just as long as you know that I'm not your attorney. I've been very liberal with the using and sending of of that 15 minute link. So if you're Please a member do. of the commons, feel free to take advantage of that benefit. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm always happy to chat. So yeah, so back to, to the services agreement. Those are really critical in having not just a handshake agreement, have a lot of folks that 
think that they've entered into a really friendly relationship where they're going to provide some type of services and expect to get paid at the end of the month. And some things are pre-agreed, but it's all sort of, again, on this like handshake, good faith agreement. So what a, an actual contract does, it doesn't necessarily have to be 20 pages. It can be one page. It can be a, a shortened version. It could be like a purchase order, but it has certain terms in there that protect you. It can protect how you get paid, when you get paid, what happens if you don't get paid, especially as it concerns your intellectual property, who owns that intellectual property in terms of works for hire, and then indemnification. So if something bad happens and it's not your fault as the service provider that you're not expected to indemnify all of these third parties that can make claims against the client that you're servicing, and then they can come after you. So there, there's just very like critical bare bones provisions in these services agreements that cover these relationships and what happens if things go wrong. So I highly recommend them. You can do them on your own. They don't have to, you know, they can be bullet points. They can be like a term sheet or an MOU or an LOI. And then both parties can sign off and that makes it an agreement. You know, if both parties sign off on it. So while it's great to have kind of more of a professional facing lawyer prepared agreement and that's not a necessity just as long as you have something in writing you obviously you can conduct business without all of these documents and it is better to conduct business with the documents i, I want to ask the why but the in the context of freelancers often have to deal with non-paying clients i'm sure that has come up for you as well what are the options for recouping payment from a client that doesn't pay in, in both instances, one where you, you do have solid legal documents in place and agreements and one in which you, you don't. Yeah, I mean, with solid legal documents in place, you have provisions for what happens with disputes. So if you have maybe an alternative dispute resolution provision, um, you can seek mediation or arbitration. You have it spelled out in black and white where disputes are heard, which court, whether it's in Colorado or in Texas or in I don't know, in, in Indonesia, right? So it, it really like specifies which jurisdiction governs that agreement. And then it also has provisions. So for example, if you have that accrues for late payment, if you have any kind of potentially penalty clauses that are pre-approved and that, they're, that are not against public policy that the parties can agree on, what if, if there, there is non-payment. And then if you don't have an agreement, then you're really SOL. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to prove unless you have documented evidence, which you then have to piece together. And then you would right. potentially have to take to a court and convince a court. The process would probably be more expensive than, than what you're owed. Do emails count? If I they, say, yeah, hey, I'm agreeing to pay this amount for these services instead of having could, nothing, but it's they, not as good they, as the... Yeah, they could count if you don't have an agreement in place. If you do have an, an agreement in place, usually you have a provision in there that says entire agreement. It's like a section that says entire agreement. So basically that this agreement supersedes any other prior communications, which mm. includes, you know, emails or anything else. So that those wouldn't be brought in as kind of evidence for the courts to consider. Got it. But generally, like demand letters have a really low efficacy in any time that I've had to write demand letters. The, yeah. the kind of success rate is really low. Going to court, is, like even though every person has their right to a, their day in court, the process is so cumbersome and long and expensive. Do not think that that is like a viable option to to solve your disputes. Like really think about putting that value in the front end and spending that time or extra funds, even though it may hurt, it's, it's so much wiser to do that in the contractual stage. That's good to know. While we're on the topic of agreements, somebody asked about a data processing agreement, and I'm not sure what that is. So what does a DPA cover and when should a freelancer consider using one? Yeah, I mean, a DPA covers if you're generally, if, if you handle, store, transact, or access data, personally identifiable information or health information under HIPAA. HIPAA has its own business associate agreement, but the DPA is, is typically required under the GDPR, which is a European regulation, though I think more and more with some of the stateside laws that are coming into place, those are good to have in place. But it basically summarizes what you do with, with personal data, how you handle it, and how you, as 
an entity or a service deal with any kind of data breaches. Got it. Okay, let's move on to copyrights and IP. It's my understanding that in the U.S. generally, a freelancer who creates copyright protected material is the sole owner of that material and the client cannot use it without committing copyright infringement. Clients, however, often want to own the work product outright. So how do you suggest freelancers allow clients access to the IP while protecting their own rights? For licenses, I mean, this again goes back to having a solid agreement in place and you would you potentially, if you include any of your IP into deliverables for the client, you want to make sure that you continue to own that IP coming out of that relationship and that the client just has a license to, to use only with respect to the work product that you've created for them. So it's super important that you have common law protection for copyright, for trademarks and patents. And it's not quite the same that you do actually need to register, but just generally trade secret, confidential information, all of that stuff needs to be contractually accounted for. And the relationship, even if you think about this happens in, in DAOs all the time, right? That like, there's a bunch of IP that's created and technically you could assert ownership of, of the DAO instead of the individual contributors or vice versa. So it's just important to kind of set forth all of those rights and obligations at the very beginning. So I know like mutual NDAs are common, but the, in the, the web three space is about like openness and the free flow of information right. transparency, which NDAs kind of inhibit. Do you, have you seen any interesting things happen at the crux of DAOs trying to or not implementing NDAs because of that philosophy? I think there's been a pushback against NDAs for a while. Definitely don't see very many DAOs adopting NDAs. Um, I mean, they should somewhere address confidential information, that, but that probably goes into like your more like developer services agreement. On the venture side of things, investors have been reticent to to sign and enter into NDAs for forever. So they won't enter into those. And there's just other ways to address kind of confidentiality and confidential information. And you could do that in in terms of conditions as well, in services agreement. You can hard code that into NFTs as well. I mean, there's you know ways to kind of include that and it's more maybe technologically advanced and that's not as broad, I guess. Got it. Okay. Let's shift to money and taxes the things that everybody is thinking about all the time. That's a little bit of a joke. I don't think a lot of people that I meet spend a lot of time thinking about taxes. And that's one of the, the benefits of Opolis. We do the tax stuff so that you don't have to think about it. But freelancers who have not yet joined, they are definitely thinking about this, trying to put some aside for April or they have to pay these quarterlies. I had a free freelance taxes could be its entire episode on its own. But from a legal perspective, what should freelancers be thinking about in terms of income and taxes, forms, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, it's pretty important to obtain 1099s and fill out W-9s for any contract or relationship that you're in, just so that you can document that and then submit that to the IRS. Their compliant tax compliance is a, is a big hot ticket item on the agenda of, of the policymakers and of the IRS next year. So I think they're going to be clamping down quite a bit in 2023, especially with the new regulation that has has been released. So it's really important on the tax side to be compliant. So making sure that along with your services agreement that you're filling out a W-9 and then you're receiving all of that information by, I think that the cutoff date is January 30th of each year. So you're getting all of those things in order in December and January and getting those 1090 things. So what was that regulation that you just mentioned? The Inflation Reduction Act is supposed to bring about quite a bit of changes in the, in the tax code in 2023. It's not the one that we're all hoping for, which is that we don't have to supply these forms to tell the IRS exactly what they already know. No, not quite that one. <laughs> but the uh, the IRS is beefing up and I think they're going to take a, a much more active role in coming down, especially in the, in the DAO space. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful that the, the only space of the crypto industry as a whole that's working is the ones being focused on the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be nice if we got our consumer protections in the form of the centralized FTX things and not the exactly. centralized things we're doing on the DAO space. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Do you have any additional thoughts on that, on anything that's happened in the past uh, few weeks? I don't know. It's, it's just a... It's an affront to the whole industry and the fact that, like you said, they're coming down on, on DeFi where they should have been coming down on more centralized finance and, and 
I'm bringing in regulatory parameters and guardrails here. It's just, you know, it's a, I don't know. I don't want to throw words like this out there, but it's, it, it's very corrupt, right? Like it's the, the sixth signal of corruption. And that's really sad because there's a lot of good players that are doing really good things. And so I do hope that there is justice for those affected. And I do hope that SBF faces what's due and owing to him under our legal system. I think if, if he doesn't, I think that that would send a really, really bad signal. That is a, that's a good take. Okay. Shifting back to terms of use and privacy policies. I know there's a lot of confusion out there about terms of use on websites. Can you tell us what a website's terms of use is and whether freelancers need them on their websites? Yeah. I mean, it depends on, on exactly what industry you're in and how much interface you have with clients through your website. So I would generally recommend in addition or in lieu of a services agreement that you do have terms and conditions or terms of use. You can pinpoint a lot of those same provisions that I mentioned earlier, like indemnification, limitation of liability, governing law, where disputes are handled in in those terms and conditions and terms of use. And again, it depends on how much interaction there is with the platform. If you do have a live platform, then you absolutely need terms of use. But if you're more kind of external services industry provider, then it could be good to just incorporate those terms of use, even if you just have a purchase order or something that's shorter, that's not a full-blown services agreement, you can reference out and incorporate those terms and conditions or terms of use into into that document. Privacy policy just depends if you're handling end-user data or customer data on behalf of the client or even the client's data, and then how you handle that usage and that transmission of data. So that, that's pretty important to have as well. Then again, a lot of it just depends you know, how platform-facing you are and if people are going onto your website, if they're putting in orders, or if they're purchasing services or products through the platform as well. And, and another topic of interest for our community is the terms of use for content creators. As digital media expands, so does the demand for content creators. So yeah. what do creators need to know and what should they be looking for in terms of terms of use? Yeah, I mean, so they should be thinking about content creators. One should be thinking about name, image, and likeness issues. If they are, you know, using kind of their, like as an influencer or as a content creator, if they're using any of that kind of persona and information in NFTs or, or any other kind of medium, then you want to protect that. And then you're just, you're mostly thinking about licenses and, and that IP as well. So you would want to cover that in the terms of use, right? And unless it's stipulated somewhere else or in another type of contract, but you're basically wanting to preserve all ownership of that, that content and IP in you or in an agency that licenses your IP to others. There's a lot of relationships that exist like that as well. From the beginning all the way through here, a lot of it sounds complicated. Like maybe I would have to have some legal experience to to navigate these things. It sounds a little daunting. Maybe it's expensive. Do I need a lawyer to help me set up all these things? Are there resources that I can find? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm generally like a as a lawyer, I'm more generally like in like an empowerment type lawyer where I think that you should be able to go and figure a lot of this stuff out and not have gatekeepers as lawyers. But there are things that are very nuanced in the law. I would say IP is one of those things. Employment can be another one of those things, like strict you know, W-2 employment. So I would say it depends. You can set up an LLC on your own and especially a single member LLC. There's enough services that set up LLCs for you that will will present you with all of the documentation that you need. So like an operating agreement, your initial minutes of an organization, any kind of banking resolutions that you need if you were to set up a bank account. So all of that is usually comes in a package these days. You don't need a lawyer to help you with that. If you get to a stage where things become more complicated and potentially you have maybe more members coming in or you want to explore a holding company subsidiary relationship, you know, things kind of get more nuanced and complicated. I would definitely recommend speaking with a lawyer. Terms and conditions and privacy policies, I would also recommend. I know that there's actually some some pretty decent AI sites like Termally, maybe that oh, that are creating those. And that's a decent first step option, right? Like it's better to have that than nothing at all. Yeah. So I shouldn't then, just like, go it, to 
to Apple iTunes and, and grab the like a million page one that they have control app, change out Apple for my name. And I think, yeah, pro- probably not, <laughs> probably not. But I, you know, there's so many, like, like I said, AI platforms at the moment that can create like bespoke terms that is a really, really decent starting point. And again, better to have that than nothing at all. And then once again, you get more mature and you have questions, you can always use a lawyer as more of like a, a resource in, in validating whether, you know, something that needs to be looked at or not as well. Okay. So I just, on the topic of AI real quick, it sounds like AI is able to accomplish a lot of the like routine things that lawyers were doing, or maybe the paralegals were doing. Did you worry about it replacing too much or does it free up lawyers from doing all the busy work so they can focus more on the creative? Yeah, no, I'm super pro legal tech. I think that you're always going to need that analytical approach that I, I don't know that AI has yet. You know, maybe that, that will be there in the future, but I think that it does free up a lot of kind of busy work that a lot of lawyers are not willing to let go of as well. Like mm. an older generation of lawyers that their bread and butter, they've always done it and they're not, they're sure. pretty skeptical of the technology. They need to retire so eventually. They will retire eventually, right? So, but I'm, I'm very pro kind of technology and I think that at least like some of the more complex, nuanced structures, even in yeah. like blockchain and Web3, right? This is a totally novel area of the law that you do need somebody who can help you think of legal structures, relationships, you know, how tokens are, you know, all of that stuff that I don't think that AI sure. quite you know it. for sure that there is an AI out there who is watching this episode who's like, you know what, yeah, challenge accepted. And they're going to tr- <laughs> trust it. Bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as we wrap up, I'm interested in when you, when you hung out your own shingle, going out on your own can be a little bit daunting. Where did you find your first clients or how was it difficult to, to start building up your portfolio? You know, it's a kind of a specific question for the legal. Like it's, I think every industry is different. So a lot of my initial clients came from other lawyers. So being a member of the referrals. bar association or yeah, referrals or like specific lawyer group, they knew that I specialized in corporate and securities and transactional and technology. And so once that came up, they had their list of, of lawyers that they referred out to. And that's really how I, I started. I do think that that's more general though. It, so like the, the specific lawyer groups obviously aren't mm. going to help a freelance graphic designer, but the concept of yeah. joining professional associations, networking, getting your clients to referrals, that's pretty standard for the industry. Yeah, maybe industry. You're right. Yeah, but that's true. I guess I was just thinking of a, but there's a specific more focused women on law firm lawyer group that, that really helped okay. set my course. And so I was more thinking about that, but yeah, you're right. There's, but th- those exist in, across all industries. Mm. Okay, cool. So a lot of members of the commons contribute to DAOs. And one of the value propositions that we talk about is that when you wrap yourself in this employment vehicle, you are helping to de-risk yourselves so that the DAO doesn't have to. And one of the other talking points I use is that when the DAO doesn't have an operating agreement, the members of the DAO are in a general partnership. So my question would be, is that a thing I can keep saying? Is that kind of right? Should DAOs have operating agreements? And I guess any other color that you'd like to add there? Yeah, this is a difficult one. On the one hand, for members of the commons or any other freelancers, contributors that do wrap themselves in an entity like an LLC, that does offer additional protection as far as their personal assets are concerned. As far as the broader DAO, I mean, there are certain DAOs that I think should remain unwrapped. I know that's <laughs> among the legal community that has both sides that support that or don't. But I think if you look at the case of Uki DAO and that recent CFTC action against Uki DAO, which was totally unwrapped, and the CFTC is trying to come after all of the individual members that voted, and they're claiming that it is a general partnership, that there's, you know, joint in several liability across all of the, the, the partners there. I think in that case, I think that sort of brings the spotlight on if Ukida was was wrapped in some kind of a very basic legal entity, it had it could still very much have on-chain governance and 
incorporate kind of the basic formalities required under whichever jurisdiction's LLC laws as far as an operating agreement or any kind of um, like an administrative agent or anything that they need to to register with the state, but have all of their governance done online and, and having all of those principles uh, embedded into a smart contract. I, I think in that case, that, that does show that would have been a better outcome for these Ukidao members who now are, are not motivated to participate in DAO governance because of the potential liability. And I don't know what's coming out of that, but I think that it's a huge affront to DAO governance, which we focus on so much. So having something basic like that as a template in place would be recommending. I wish we had more time to dive into the question of where is the legal liability? And I don't know if that's an answer that we can get to, but it's kind of the theoretical of like, does having one share, let's use compound as an example, you have mm-hmm. one comp, you hold it, that gives you governance rights, but you don't vote. Does that make you a member of the DAO? And all that, that's a, I'm sure, a deep legal rabbit hole. It is, explored. yeah. I'd love to go down it too, but I'm, I, I find it really interesting. All, all things DAO governance is super interesting. Season two, okay. Unemployable. We'd love to have you back. Thank you so much for joining me on Unemployable today. This has been a great conversation, and I know our audience is going to find your insights and tips valuable on their freelance journey. Where can people find you? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. You can find me on, on Telegram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. As always, To the unemployable community, I'd love to hear your thoughts and reactions to the episode. You can tweet at the show, at Opolis, with the hashtag unemployablepod. At Unemployable, I'll always be looking ahead to see what's on the horizon and bringing you top strategies for thriving in the new economy with freedom, flexibility, and peace of mind. I hope you got a lot out of this episode on legal tips for freelancers. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast player. Your ratings and reviews help other unemployables find the show. Until next time, I'm your host, Joshua Lapidus, a founding steward of Opolis, co-founder of SportDAO, resigned legislative director, and tenured professor here at Unemployable University. Mm-hmm.